tonight we are going to the moon. Behind me is a picture of the Ariane 5 rocket in French Guyana, which is getting ready to launch the latest lunar probe, Smart One, and blast off is due in a couple of hours from now, and we'll be watching it. But first of all, our promised look at the sky. Look low down in the north, and there you see the seven stars of Ursa Major, the Great Bear, which people call the Plough. They're not very bright, but they are make up a very distinctive pattern, and they never set. Look at the second star from the left, called Mizar, a small star called Alcor, very close to it. And telescopically, Mizar itself is seen to be made up of two stars. At the other end of the pattern, the two pointers, the white manic, the orange dupe, and they show the way to the pole star, which lies almost in the direction of the Earth's axis, and therefore seems to stay virtually still with everything else moving around it. That's in Ursa Minor, the little bear, and you see the little bear curving down over the great bear. So there we have it, and those stars never set, and therefore you will always see them somewhere whenever the sky is dark and clear. And now, on to our main theme. Smart, small missions for advanced research and technology is a lunar probe built by the European Space Agency, though of course many nations contributed. In many ways, it's breaking new ground. A different kind of motor, an ion drive, an ion not iron, and of course, the very latest equipment. One important instrument, DKIX, to study the moon in X-rays, was built at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in Oxford, where I now am. We're delighted to welcome project scientist, Dr. Sarah Duncan. Sarah, welcome to the sky at night. What are the main objectives of Smart One? Well, SMART-1 is a really interesting mission. It's the first in a series of technology demonstration missions that have been produced by the European Space Agency. And this is the very first European mission that's actually going to go to the moon. Its primary objectives are to test new technologies for future space missions to make sure things work before they spend more money on developing uh, more expensive technology, and also to carry out great science. Um, and obviously, there are many things that we still need to know about the moon. We've learned a great deal about the moon, but there's still an amazing amount that we don't know. That's right, there is. I mean, people think that we know everything there is to know about the moon. We've, we've explored the moon with more spacecraft than any other body in the solar system apart from the Earth. But there are still some fundamental things that we don't know about the moon. And that's primarily be because uh, there are still some missing gaps in our knowledge of, about the moon. And that's what Smart One's going to do. It's going to fill in those gaps. Of course, it carries the very latest equipment. It's packed with new technology that's been developed specifically for this mission and to test technology for future solar system exploration for missions such as Bepi Colombo that will be going to Mercury in, in 2011. And in a few hours now, it's going to be on its way to the moon. It will, hopefully, fingers crossed, if all goes well, we'll be on our way to the moon. The development of Smart One has been amazingly quick, just five years. That's a third of the time for normal space car projects. The lead scientist is Dr. Bernard Foying. I caught up with him at the press launch of Smart One last month. Bernard, welcome to the sky at night. Thank you. Welcome to the moon. Now, of course, we are very used to noisy rockets, but uh, this is something different. What about the ion drive? Okay, we'll use a noisy rocket launched from the start using ion 5, which will bring us to Earth's orbit. But from Earth's orbit, we'll use this very gentle ion drive that delivers a thrust per mass which is 10 times more efficient than chemical propulsion. And there, with patience, with a thrust which is only 7 grams, just the weight of a postcard or the, the thrust of your blow on your hand, if you exert it for 15 months, you could reach the moon. Can you give um, a brief rundown of the ion drive? Yeah, ion drive is just a technique where you take some uh, atoms, you electrify them, you, you charge them, and then you accelerate them at very high speed out of the rocket. And this way you get a thrust which is very strong, which pushes the rocket in the other direction. There are different ways to get the energy to accelerate these ions. Either environment friendly, we use solar power, that's solar electric propulsion, but also you can use other techniques like a nuclear electric propulsion. And this would uh, have application for them to go even in the outer solar system. The main disadvantage is the, the low thrust. Yeah, 
So it, this technique is only applicable when you are already in Earth's orbit. So still, we need to have very powerful launcher from Earth, like we, the Ariane 5. But while you are in Earth's orbit, if you are patient, and if you want to carry big uh, cargoes, this is a very efficient way to travel. And this, you think, is a, a first of a great many ion drive rockets? Yeah, that's a first for Europe, and also it's the first time that we will leave the Earth this way. Then we will intend to use this type of technology to travel in deep space, to go to visit uh, um, the inner solar system. We can reach Mars, we can reach uh, Mercury, Venus, and also we can have some uh, applications with this system. When you arrive, um, it will go into orbit, Yes, so first the travel itself will be quite delicate because we will, for the first time, use this type of engine where we will have to drive constantly the spacecraft to reach the neighborhood of the moon, then start surfing on the gravitational influence of the moon, and then we get captured by the moon, and we try to spiral down using again the ion propulsion, and then go on a scientific orbit, which will have an altitude of 300 kilometers up to 10,000 kilometers. From there, we will map the moon globally for the first time in X-rays, in the infrared, and also with a miniature optical camera. How long will it continue to operate? While we have reached this um, scientific orbit, we have a baseline of six months operation, but we hope that if everything do does well, we would extend this to a further year. This is put down as a, a British mission, and to a large extent it is, but uh, how many other nations have contributed? From the industrial side, all either member states, which are 15 countries, have been involved. From the industrial side, also a large part of the countries were involved. And from the scientific side, all countries were contributing. But the UK in particular provided one of the newest experiments, the kicks. And so after the data are obtained, we will also open the whole result to the world international community and we'll use those data to help our colleagues to prepare the next mission. The Japanese, which have two missions after us, possibly the Indian and the Chinese, and we'll also guide our US colleagues to determine some places for returning sample from the moon. Well, let's hope all goes well. I'm sure it will. Bernard, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, sir, Patrick. This is a very special night. More than 100 people gathered here to watch the launch of Smart One. The science is concerned, they're friends and relations. Obviously, so much can go wrong. There's tremendous tension here, and we're waiting now for the great launch, the great blast off. Once the rocket has been launched, the satellite is released into Earth orbit. The solar panels expand and begin to use the sun's energy to ionize atoms of xenon gas. These ions propel the spacecraft, though at a very gentle speed. The force is the same as that of a postcard hitting your hand. The spacecraft is gradually nudged into a wider and wider elliptical orbit around the Earth before being captured by the Moon's gravity. It gradually changes its orbit to circle the Moon, this time featuring both the North and the South Poles. All going well, it will take Smart One 15 months to reach the Moon. Professor David Southwood is ESA's Director of Science. I caught up with him at the press launch of Smart One last month. David, it will take a long time to get to the moon. It's certainly uh, uh, not the fastest route to get to the moon, but it is, it's kind of fun because for the first time one is driving the spacecraft, once finding one's way through the gravity field of the moon and the earth and the sun. Uh, it's much more hands-on navigation than the traditional rocketry and then just the catapult, you know. What would happen during the voyage? Well, we'll be checking it very, very regularly and making sure that our predictions of where we are are correct because uh, the engine is going to burn for long periods of time. And so we have to make sure that uh, everything is going as predicted. It's When we went to the moon with the astronauts many years ago, sort of halfway to the moon, you would fire the engines for a mid-course correction we're going to be doing a permanent mid-course correction all the, way, all the way to the moon. So it's going to be much more like driving a car, so to speak, than, uh, than flying a rocket. Well, the smart will certainly send back vast amounts of data. Do you think it will overturn any of our cherished theories? 
it's always fun to hope we're going to overturn cherished theories. I mean, uh, if you're a scientist, somehow you want to shock, you want to find something new. On the other hand, uh, uh, we, do, we do have a feeling we know uh, the moon quite well, so I wouldn't be putting a lot of money on it if you're a betting man, but um, certainly we're going, to, we're going to enhance our understanding of the system. That I think I can say with confidence. We have a hole, we're not sure why. There are so many things that could go wrong over at Kuru. We must simply wait and hope that we get off in time. Meanwhile, there's tremendous tension here. Those concerned, their families and friends, all waiting to see whether the smart one really is going to be sent off to the moon or whether they have to wait for another day. We are just sleeping. A little while ago, I talked to one of the project scientists, Dr. Sarah Duncan. This is a, a model of the Smart One spacecraft, and on this face here you can see a number of instruments, but the ones that are most important for looking at the moon are these three here. And this one here is called SIR. It's a Smart One infrared spectrometer, and this is going to look at the moon and study the mineralogy of the rocks uh, to basically find out what rock types are actually on the surface there. Now, although this is covered by Clementine, this will have a much higher spectral resolution than previously uh, covered on the moon, and so this is going to be a very important instrument indeed. What we have here is a micro camera. It's built in Switzerland and it's very much smaller than traditional cameras that have been used on spacecraft. Um, normally these are very, very heavy indeed and this is just um, a, a kilogram in weight, so it's a bag of sugar. Now this instrument here, which is uh, my baby if you like, this is DKIX. This oh, yes. is the X-ray spectrometer that's been uh, designed and built here in the UK. This is actually a full-scale model of DKIX. It weighs four and a half kilograms, and normally these kind of instruments weigh much, much more and are something like a meter in size, and so we've managed to compact it down into something much smaller. Now, when this arrives to the moon on Smart One, we're going to be looking at the elements on the surface of the moon. We're going to be looking at the moon in X-rays, and it's going to produce the very first global map of the moon in X-rays. It's never been done before, so that's going to be a first for the UK, and uh, we're absolutely delighted that this is going to be flying on Smart One. During Smart One's journey to the moon, it was studying other X-ray sources. Which sources? It's going to be looking at active galactic nuclei, binary stars, and if we're lucky and we get a, a comet passing by, we'll turn our, our, our detectors to that comet and see if it's emitting any X-rays. When would you get the first results back? Well, we'll start taking data as soon as we actually get to the moon. But for an instrument like DKIX, we need to map the moon over a long period of time in order to accumulate enough counts to um, understand the data that's being sent back to us. So we won't get results until we add all of the data from the whole six months of the mission. But uh, instruments like Amy and Sir will be able to send back uh, data almost straight away and we'll be able to start analysing that. I wonder what surprise we're going to get. Well, we'll have to wait and see. We're going to have to wait some time, but I'm sure it'll be exciting. I'm sure it is. Sarah, thank you very much. But why study the moon at X-ray wavelengths? I spoke to Professor Manuel Grande. Well, what we're doing is looking at the fluorescence of the moon. The sun shines on the moon in X-rays. The moon fluoresces in X-rays, the same way as a shirt fluoresces if you shine ultraviolet light on it. And the colours that the moon fluoresces are absolutely indicative of the surface material of the moon. So if there's silicon in the surface of the moon, the moon will fluoresce in the silicon X-ray colour. If there's magnesium, the moon will fluoresce in the, in the magnesium X-ray colour. And by measuring the amount of each of those colours, you can tell exactly what the moon is made of. You mentioned the ratio between iron and magnesium. Why is that important? Well, the thing that's important about magnesium and iron is because it tells you about the thermal history of the moon. We know that the moon um, condensed from this mess that was made when a Mars-sized object hit the Earth. Um, what we're not certain of is what that mixture could be. The ratio of magnesium to iron constrains that mixture. For example, if the ratio of magnesium to iron was the same as on the Earth, then you would know that they couldn't have come from the same place. You know that for this theory to be true, there must be less magnesium than there is on Earth. You know, most people accept the giant impact theory now, but not everybody. Do you think this will settle the question? I think this is one of the real last building blocks in that theory, yeah. This is a Russian globe of the moon, more than 40 years old now, and one of the first to show both hemispheres, the side we see from Earth and the side we don't, which is always turned away from us. And the Russian, I remember, sent me that. They used some of my own observations. But there have been many lunar missions since then. Roger, the moon. 
They were magnificent pictures. I'm not going to say they show us more detail than we've got from the orbiters, because they probably don't. But don't forget that people were actually seeing them direct for the first time. This is bound to add to our knowledge. This photography that we're seeing at the present moment is unique. It is superb. It is magnificent. It's never been done before. And we're getting a picture on the TV. I'm going to step off the lamp now. That's one small step for man. And we have a liftoff, the swing arms moving back. The Saturn V lifting off the pad, building up thrust. We cleared the tower. Okay, here we go, a big one. <laughs> off the ground, the floor. There we go. Fifth. Going from right to left. I was rolling on the moon one day. In a merry, merry month of December. Now, May, May. Oh, what a nice day. Oh, funny there's not a cloud in the sky. There is boring soil. Well, don't move it till I see it. It's all over. Two, one, ignition. Right away, Houston. Well, I'm at the control station at the old ground station at the Art Aero, Rutherford, Appleton, Waterford. With me, one of our regular guests, Dr. Helen Walker. Helen, delighted to have you back. It's been a long time now since Neil Armstrong stepped onto the moon. Yes, and uh, what we have here is a historic piece of equipment from the Apollo days. This is the actual control rack that we use to control communications with Apollo, particularly Apollo 16. And we can actually see here some buttons labeled LM for the lunar module and CSM for the command and service module. And well, they're still here. We're not covering those over. We've had many missions to the moon now, going back to 1959, but there's still quite a lot we don't know. What we tend to forget is, of course, that when the Apollo astronauts went to the moon and collected rock, um, what happened was, of course, they went to the flat bits, they went to the bit on the equator, and, of course, they went to the bit facing us. And uh, the old lunar missions and the Russian, they certainly show that the other side of the moon is very different from the side facing us. And of course, there are lots of places on the moon with different types of rock that we've never sampled. In 1994, the Americans went back to the moon with Clementine. And of course, this is an unmanned satellite that's orbiting the moon. It's orbiting around in the polar direction, like Smart One will do. And one of the great things Clementine thought it saw was ice. Uh, this is down in these dark valleys at the South Pole where the sun never shines and we've not had any confirmation of it but of course we'd love to believe there is some ice on the moon in the dark shadows in the deep craters. I don't believe there is any. Well it was a very nice try by the Clementine satellite to try and find ice and they thought they detected it. Um, Lunar Prospector followed it up, and again, they, tr they th weren't sure whether they found it or not. And, of course, when they crashed Prospector into the moon, no ice. So I think, unfortunately, you might be right, but we're still looking. I, there is evidence. I mean, I, I would like, uh, as with most of these things, uh, I like to see things myself. So, so uh, clearly one wants to um, really check it out. I mean, those polar craters that are in shadow, um, it's very tempting and uh, ice is extremely important wherever it occurs in our universe and so it's very fundamental to trying to find. Smart One will look at the illumination of those craters and it will look at it through the whole of a, whole of a year which is something that hasn't been done before so it will test the idea that these really are 
regions of perpetual darkness. It won't actually tell you itself how they got there, whether it was cometary impact or whether it was in interstellar chemistry or, or what was going on. Do you believe that his eyes there? I suspect that there may be chemical interactions with the solar wind which can give you ice. I, I'm not certain that I believe the comets put it there, I have no, to say. Right. Thank <laughs> you. If the ion drive is successful, as we hope it will be, it will open up a whole new range of possibilities. We're about to start on SMART-2. It's a completely different kind of spacecraft, but we're, uh, we, should, we hope to get it started in November. Start, uh, uh, we'll be doing it jointly with the Americans, and it's the prelude to building a gravitational wave observatory. And so we've started the idea of small missions to really prove a point, to really test out how things are before we go into big missions. Some of the new astronomical observatories we're planning in a decade or so's time are going to consist of multiple spacecraft flying in formation. So you don't want to launch several spacecraft and realize you haven't got something right. So we're, we're, we're going to do the technology testing first and uh, I think we should get the positive sign as early as this November. Potentially right, yeah, unbelievable. Uh, and I'm coming up to within in half a minute of launch. We had a hole, we don't know why. So far, I think phenomenal. Looking at the screen now, it's there, ready to go. And in 15 seconds, it should lift off. Ah, firing. I think we're going to have lift off. What the delay was, we're not sure. Six, five, four, three, two. It's through we watch. And we're here. And we have ignition. I can see now. Flames coming out, and in one point, and they're off. There it goes, there it goes, smart is actually now on its way to the moon. Of that nerve-wracking delay, we're not quite sure it was. I can see the rocket now, flames coming out, it's on its way, and uh, we have a liftoff. That was scary. I wonder what the trouble was. Luckily they fixed it, and there, streaky way into the sky, the smaller and smaller as it goes, smaller and smaller, further and further away, on the, the long, long journey, which end up on the on the moon itself. <laughs> well, the tension has relaxed. After that hold, then all is well, and Smart One is now on its way to the moon. It'll get there in 15 months, and we hope send back amazing results. So, congratulations to all concerned. Been a great evening. Meanwhile, don't forget it's new letter time. What's new letter? Send your stamp to the envelope to new letter number 91, BBC Birmingham, B57QQ. And when I come back next month, we're dealing this time with the end of a successful mission, the end of the Galileo probe's Jupiter. So until then, from a very happy and satisfied Rutherford Apple of the Morrisville.